as well as to connect researchers, entrepreneurs, trailblazers from all fields in order to generate multidisciplinary and I might say very much needed solutions for our society's uh, pressing challenges. Following this context, um, I would say that today's Falling Walls Lab Marius Kodok Security Actions Competition will gather 15 MSCA fellows from across a very, very wide array of scientific disciplines. In what I also call last year, the dragon's den of the science world, each fellow will be given three grilling minutes to pitch their research topic or an innovative project or idea to win a spot at the Falling Walls Lab final, which will take place in Berlin on the 7th of November, 2021. They will get a chance like this to become um, a breakthrough winner uh, of the year in the emerging talent category of the Falling Walls uh, competition. The two co-finalists um, will then be able to attend also the Falling Walls Lab conference uh, and Science Summit, which also includes the Falling Walls Lab competition. This is taking place in, in Berlin uh, between the 7th and 9th of, of November 2021. This is an incredible event, absolutely unique, because it gathers people who are finding solutions to the greatest challenges of our time. And they will bring the world's attention back to Berlin on an incredible day, and that is the, the day of the fall of the Berlin Wall, to commemorate and symbolistically show what human unity and collaboration can actually achieve. The 15 very brave uh, researchers, MSCA fellows, who we will be listening to today, will show us firsthand how science pretty much impacts our daily lives and how research can answer today's, but also especially tomorrow's pressing challenges. Their ideas tackle global issues in areas such as healthcare, climate action, biodiversity, engineering technology, as well as various life sciences. But we will have also an incredible jury to be able to judge between those 15 research projects. So I'm honored to introduce you to our distinguished jury composed of Denis Christofidou, Director General for Education, Youth, Sports and Culture at the European Commission, who is also the chair of our jury. She has a very, very tough task alongside the rest of the members of jury to listen to, to all of these ideas. And the toughest is to choose the, the co-winners. So good luck to, to you and, and to all the, the fellow colleagues. Our next member of the jury is Stefan Bergmans. He's Director for Research and Innovation at European University Association. Next to him and Themis, we also have Mostafa Munir, Chair of the Marie Curie Alumni Association. Xiao Menghu, MSCA Fellow at the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne and co-winner of the Falling Walls Lab MSCA 2020 competition. She has been the co-winner and we look forward to also hearing from her experience together with Aurélie Lacroix, who also joins our, our jury and who is an MSCA fellow at the Sixfold Bioscience and co-winner um, of the uh, Falling Walls Lab Marie Skolowska Curie Actions 2020 competition. As I was saying, the members of the jury will have the tough task to evaluate each of our contestants today based on three criteria. One is the breakthrough side of the research program that they are doing. The second is the relevance and the third is impact on society. These will all be composed together with the structure and performance of the pitches prepared by the 15 finalists. And now uh, an interesting point for all of you uh, tuning in live on our, on our stream um, on the website of the competition or Facebook or Twitter. There are several key rules for our competition. As I was highlighting earlier, each competitor uh, has, has recorded, has pre-recorded a pitch of a duration of three minutes in which they have very clearly tried to explain the concept of their research. After we will all be listening to their pitch, we have two minutes in which one member of the jury will ask them a question. They will try and formulate this as, as quickly as possible. And then afterwards, the fellow will have just a few seconds to answer, around 45 seconds to answer this question. Now, what's interesting is that you definitely also have the possibility to address your question. 
as you will see, the research pieces of project are absolutely incredible. So we are sure this will entice your interest. So please make sure that you take notes and you send us your questions in Slido. Now, this is very important for you to know that uh, in order for you to ask all these questions in Slido, you do need to register on the website. This will also give you the power to vote. Indeed, it's not just the jury that is going to pick the third finalist as well as the two co-winners, but we will also have a very special award and that's the public's award. So if you haven't done so, so far, please register on the website of the Falling Walls Lab MSCA competition. Make sure you can one, vote, and then two, ask interesting questions to our competitors. Thank you so much for tuning uh, in today. And of course, today is all about MSEA and the MSEA fellows that have decided to pitch their ideas. So I would very much love for you to hear more from Director General Themis Christophidou about both the importance of this project um, as well as MSEA um, actions in general. Themis, you have the floor. Thank you, Raluca. Good afternoon, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, dear fellows. I'm truly honored to be with you today to open this fifth edition of the Falling Walls Lab, Marie Skodowska Curie Actions. This scientific competition is part of a worldwide science contest showcasing the most promising research projects. It rewards innovative initiatives and ideas to address some of the most pressing challenges facing our societies but it also rewards quality, diversity, passion, and openness. I'm very proud that our MSCA fellows can take part in an event which acknowledges their excellence and exceptional skills and competences. Let me say a word about the Maris Kodoske Curie Actions before we kick off the proceedings. The MSCA and the Horizon Europe have a new motto, developing talents, advancing research. This is the essence of the program, excellence, research, and development of skills. Over the past seven years, the MSCA have supported 65,000 researchers in Europe and beyond, including 25,000 doctoral candidates, as well as more experienced researchers. They have funded more than 1,000 excellent international doctoral networks. The MSCA support not only individual researchers, but also institutions, notably in developing new innovative doctorates. Under the Horizon Europe program, the MSCA continue playing a key role in training high-skilled, adaptable, and resilient researchers. The importance of these efforts has proven to be crucial during the pandemic and for the post-COVID recovery. In the years to come, we will further enhance international cross-sectoral and interdisciplinary cooperation, which are the key dimensions of our program. We have introduced some novelties too, such as the MSCA Green Charter or new guidelines for the supervisors. And I'm very glad that the program can play a guiding role in this field. We're trying to bring our, our researchers closer to the public and communicate science to non-specialist audiences. For example, the MSCA fund the European Researchers' Night, which took place last week on Friday, 14 September, across 30 countries in Europe and beyond. The European Researchers' Night will also bring researchers to schools, because today, perhaps more than ever, it is crucial that the, for the broad public to understand the impact research and innovation have on their daily life. And it is also crucial that citizens engage and have their word to say on these topics. Communicating science is also being able to re reach out to policymakers and to businesses to convert ideas into services and products to the benefit of our economies and societies. This is what our 15 contestants will do today. They will present the result of their research project in clear and understandable words so that each of us can grasp their relevance despite the complexity of the topic. 
Dear con contestants, I'm looking forward to hearing your pitches. And I can say on behalf, behalf of the whole jury that we are all very excited to listen to your presentations. Regardless of the final result, I already want to congratulate all of you for your courage in taking part in this competition. And thank you for your curiosity that has led you towards new solutions that can someday benefit us all. The jury and the audience are ready to listen to you. Good luck to everyone. Thank you so much, Demis, for your very, very kind words. And I, I don't think anybody could have put it uh, any better. Curiosity for them will lead to a lot of benefits to us all and, and the growth of our society. So thank you so much. Um, with no further ado, we definitely want to see which are the next walls to fall uh, in, the, in, in the world of, of science and for our society. So without any further ado, I think we can kick off the round of pitches. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could see through walls or have heat vision like our childhood hero, Superman? Unless you're Superman, you cannot have them all until now. The good news is that you do not have to go ask Superman anymore because you can ask me. At the Institut Langevin in Paris, I'm designing a camera that can visualize heat through obstacles and help us identify survivors in a fire accident. Our universe is filled with particles of energy called photons. The human eye can see things because of its ability to detect these photons and create images. However, not all types of photons can be detected by the human eye. Infrared photons are photons emitted by hot objects near room temperature, like the human body. Infrared cameras already exist, but what they lack is the power to see through obstacles. In my doctoral project, I am developing a new imaging technique that will allow us to see infrared photons which are hidden behind walls. Imagine that you have finally found the perfect opportunity to visit the Eiffel Tower after months of pandemic lockdowns. But alas, when you go there, it turns out to be extremely foggy. You cannot see anything and you are unable to take a picture of the Iron Lady with your camera. I use innovative materials known as complex scattering media that allow us to recreate photographs even when the objects are hidden behind obstacles or walls like fog, so that your next trip to the Eiffel is picture perfect. Our novel infrared camera is based on the technique of speckle imaging, where the obstacle is cleverly used to encode the photographic information, which can then be reconstructed by special algorithms. A new thermal camera can be used for contactless medical diagnostics, for detecting skin cancer, identifying dangerous chemicals and visualizing mechanical faults even before they appear, all due to its ability to detect heat variations that are impervious to the human eye. I am breaking the wall of human vision and helping humans become superhumans who can save lives by looking at invisible infrared light even beyond walls. Thank you. Thank you so much. And hello to Anwesh. You're with us hello. from Paris, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Very cool. Thank you so much. And bonjour. congratulations to, to having to having the first pitch. Bonjour, bonjour, ça va? Ça va, ça va. Anwesh, thank you so much for, for your pitch and actually for absolutely turning us into superhumans. I absolutely love that. Uh, and I know so has our jury and, and you can already see Themis here on, on camera. She has prepared a question for you. So I will okay, explore sure. Themis to address this question. Hello, Anwesh. I Hello. also like the idea, the idea of being a superman or a superwoman. And uh, I have the feeling you're one too. You mentioned several possible applications of your research project, detecting right. skin cancer, visualizing survivors in fire accidents. 
Is there a specific application you would like to further develop? And if so, why? So the specific application that I would like to further develop is the seeing fire, uh, seeing live humans through fires, because this is a challenge that infrared cameras have not been able to solve, even though a lot of money is put into research for defense applications. And so this is one uh, application that I think is important for saving human lives. And this is what uh, I want to take forward as my first uh, application if my project uh, in my project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anwesh. And I, uh, I absolutely love that, that you, uh, you've been looking for photons. And actually, <clears throat> I came across a very cool joke. So you have a photon that just walks into a hotel. And the people at the reception of the hotel just ask the photon, do you need any help carrying your luggage? To which the photon goes, no, I'm traveling light. I'm exactly. <laughs> I nice. love it. I love it. And I, uh, I also actually had a, had a question from, from you, sure. if the members of our audience don't mind me taking a bit of time there. And no, sure, um, I, I agree just a little bit. You were talking to us about the implications uh, that you have for, for your piece of research to save many lives. But did right. you by any chance also think that you might have some less benign uses? Uh, could it be applied for some other uses that are not necessarily that great like military uses or other things like this did you also look at the at the possible pitfalls so um the primary uh, research in infrared uh, is actually uh, military research and uh, they are in fact used for all heat seeking missiles and drones and we know what kind of devastation they have caused. so but fortunately uh, my applications i don't think uh, they can have uh, uh, useful military applications, and uh, I, I think that's fortunate. Uh, but uh, if there are uh, any applications in the military, it will basically be to differentiate between different kinds of infrared uh, radiation, uh, but which is done in a crude manner already. So I don't think it will uh, really help uh, in military applications as much as in uh, beneficial social applications. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. And actually, congratulations for taking all these elements into consideration, because we always need to look at, at all of these levels. Yeah, true. Thank you so much, you and much. good luck with everything. Thank you. Bye, Anwish. Uh, now that we have broken the ice with, with a grilling first pitch, we're ready for our second pitch. And that is, we're going to hear more about how is it that uh, one very, very talented scientist, Magdalena Gora, is going to break the wall of polyolefins for mechanical recycling. The video for Magdalena, please. Have you ever thought about throwing your money away? No, me neither. Why then you throw your plastic packaging and beverage bottles away? If you would get money from returning it or giving it a new purpose, I would bet that you would store it and collect it like crazy. What if I tell you that's possible? What if I tell you that all those other plastic and packaging could be returned as we do it with pet bottles? If that would be an easy process, I wouldn't be here today. Many scientists around the world are working on plastic recycling, chemical recycling, mechanical recycling, feedstock recycling, biological degradation, incineration, or cross-linking. Which method is the proper one? The answer is on. I'm trying to break the wall of the mechanical recycling, which is the part of the solution. The wall there is in that pile of plastics from the yellow bin, you have mixed types of plastics and thus impossible to recycle it properly. When it comes to polyolefins that are used, for instance, in packaging or shampoo bottles, it is possible to separate them from other polymers, but you cannot separate them from each other, or it is practically impossible to do it. Mixed polypropylene and polyethylene 
have force mechanical properties than the pure materials alone because of the phase separation. This means that you cannot use the same plastic in the same application once again, just in the less demanding application. I thought, why not characterize and process existing mixtures? In 1950, we produced 1.5 million tons and nowadays we produce 322 million tons of plastic per year. At some point, all of this ends up as waste. Currently, just one third of polymer waste is recycled and the rest of it is being burned or ends up in landfills. We need to act now. We need to improve existing mixtures, focusing on polymer chemistry and chemical engineering of the materials. Properties of the real world parts made out of recycled polyolefin blends are the result of all factors chemical composition, microstructure, and processing. Your waste could make you money because it will be desired material. Dziękuję Magdalena for the presentation and congratulations. Thank you. You're joining us from, from Genova, from Italy? Uh, yes. Yes. I'm currently in Love. Genova. Lovely, lovely. I, I hope you get much better weather than we do here. Um, Magdalena, I have, as, as you can see now on, on camera, I have one member of the jury, Stefan Bergmans, that has a, a question for you. Stefan, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much. And, and thank you so much for, for, for that video, Magdalena, eye-opening. I'm a citizen. I recycle plastic, but I put everything into one single bag or bin. I was wondering, would it be helpful if we citizens helped you and in general the recycling by separating those plastics? There seem to be so many different types. Would that be helpful in, the, in, in, in uh, you know, helping uh, the recycling by separating already, maybe with a code that would be uh, on the different types of plastic? So in general, if we would organize a lot of bins for different types of uh, plastic, it would be probably really difficult because there is so many of them. And in general, this um, principle to put them in a one bin, it's not the, the worst one because since we have a technique already to separate uh, plastics inside the um, collection places. But the thing is that, uh, for example, uh, in polyolefins, they are um, having similar densities. And that's why it's more difficult to separate them. And also from the structure of the chains, the already the detectors cannot separate them ideally. So this is some kind of the, the problem already. But the other types like polycaprolactone or um, poly, uh, vinyl chloride, you can separate because they are having different structure and also they are heavier than water. So you have, few possibilities how to separate them. But with polyolefin, it's especially difficult because of the similar chain structure and similar densities. And um, we need to um, deal with existing mixtures. And I think it's possible to produce uh, new materials and um, then use it for real world parts. Great, so I feel good. I'll continue with the single bin and I leave the research to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, St Stefan. You're already gathering a lot of tips and tricks. I love it, I love it. Ne never miss the opportunity. Um, Magdalena, we have received also a question from the audience and that is, of course, you're being part of, um, of the work on, on the research that you do on, on plastic recycling, but of course you're trying to um, break a wall. So what is it, if you could tell us, that sets you apart, that sets your research apart from other pieces of research on plastic recycling? Uh, so my research is uh, really starting from the scratch. I mean, I'm um, taking the actual content of uh, separate polyethylene and polypropylene, and then I'm investigating how the content of uh, those different polymers, that means different uh, poly, uh, polymers, how they can be processed. And I'm also investigating 
so to say fast cooling so the i'm mimicking the processing and i'm investigating how at the end those mixed polymers could be applied in the real world parts also the microstructure as i present in my video uh, also is depending on the content the actual content uh, of polyethylene and polypropylene and how they are interacting uh, within the blend and um, so this is like starting from the scratch and going to uh, really mimicking the processing yeah makes sense so thank you so much magdalena we we really appreciate your your research one of all that clearly has very very strong application and also your answering our questions so thank you so much on on behalf of the jury as well as the the audience um we're now ready to proceed to the third pitch uh lined up for today uh and we have a young gentleman that is going to break the wall of spinning flame aero engines could we please get the video for Javier Crespo Anadon? I'm here to bring you good news. From today to 2038, 2 billion people will pass from poverty to middle class citizens. That is a lot of people going on vacation, visiting relatives far away, but also a big increase in CO2 emissions. We cannot afford that. We must do something. Do we ban these new people from flying? Do we substitute flying by other means of transportation? That is only possible for short routes and developed countries where infrastructure is available, but not for long routes or not so well developed countries. I'm here to talk to you about hybridization, similar to road cars. When we need full power, we will use both the electric and the conventional engines. But at cruise, where less power is needed, we will use only the electric engine, saving about 20% of CO2 emissions. However, to make this work, we must first ensure that we can switch on the engine at cruise conditions, where the temperature is minus 50 degrees Celsius and the air is thin. That is very difficult. In conventional engines, the flames, they work independently. So even if one of the flames is active, it cannot help the others to reactivate and ignition is difficult. In spinning combustion technology, the flames are oriented in a way so as to collaborate with each other. And if one of the flames is active, it will help the others to restart and ignition is easier. The wall I'm trying to break is to determine the angle of those flames, how far they need to be spaced, and also the amount of cooling we need to make this engine work. It is a combination of chemistry, aerodynamics, and thermodynamics. To conclude, we must protect the environment. There is no choice. But uh, in order to maintain how often we fly, we must alter how we fly and a spinning combustion technology is a promising technology thank you thank you so much javier uh for also both a beautiful pitch as well as a, a fantastic conclusion that is that is incredibly applicable um mustafa has already switched on his camera and he has prepared a question for you mustafa please you have the floor thank you javier this was really nice presentation uh, my question is pretty simple. I think this is already some early results. So how would you convince an investor to invest on your project uh, with this new type of engine? Okay, so I will answer you with the same words that my boss told me. This technology is readily available. You can uh, use it uh, right now. So it is not something that you need to wait three, five years. This is something that promises a 20% reduction of CO2 emissions, and it can be done just today. So the applicability and the credibility of it, I think it's very attractive. That's good to hear. Very good answer. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Javier. And actually, we also have a question from the audience. Um, and that is, how far are you to find the right angle for the flames to collaborate with each other? How far? So um, the injector can be, the flames can be oriented in 360 degrees. Uh, so the most important angle is how they are located with respect to the walls. So it is important that they point towards the wall and they point towards each other, but not so much that they burn the wall or they burn each other. So it's uh, like uh, you have to find a middle position between uh, all these uh, possibilities and make sure that uh, you are not uh, doing anything wrong or crazy with uh, the flame. Thank you so much, Javier. You're, you're one guy to try and make flames collaborate with each other. I absolutely love that. Best of luck with all your with all your research and speak to you soon. Thank you. Uh, we're now ready to move on to the fourth pitch that we have for today, and we will hear how the wall of curing diabetes is going to be broken by Kelly Blast. The video pitch for Kelly, please. Diabetes affects one out of 10 people worldwide. That means next to you right now, there's likely one or two people that suffer from this disease. Most of type 1 diabetic patients have significant stress in their lives. Imagine that you need to struggle every day with your meal. This disease limits your freedom to choose what to eat, socialize and ultimately enjoy your life. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease which leads to the destruction of insulin-producing beta cells. These beta cells are located in pancreatic islets. Current treatments are only focused on managing the disease with a lifelong insulin dependency. Untreated diabetes ends up in many complications such as heart disease, kidney failure and blindness. Even a new treatment of transplanting pancreatic islets from a donor encounters many problems. There is a lifelong immune suppression needed because of antibody formation. Also, a massive loss of pancreatic islets occurs during the procedure and a donor shortage. Here comes the solution. Oh, a spider! A very useful animal, not just because they eat annoying mosquitoes but also because they produce a unique protein called spider silk. We use spider silk as a biomaterial to mimic the natural cell environment. It shows amazing properties and highly promotes cell adhesion and proliferation. With the help of spiders, I would like to introduce you to a novel cell therapy to cure diabetes. By taking the patient's own cells in converting them back to stem cells, it is possible to differentiate as much as pancreatic islets as you need for the transplantation. Providing a unique 3D network of spider silk foams, the insulin production is enhanced and the islets are protected. These foams have just the size of a fingertip but contain hundreds of pancreatic islets. Transplanted back to a diabetic patient the patient is able to produce insulin on its own. With this personalized treatment, patients don't have to inject themselves with insulin anymore. They don't have to restrict their social life and eating behavior. And they don't suffer that much from other diseases. Instead of living a stressful life with diabetes, patients can start living the life they have always dreamed of. Hi, Kelly, lovely to meet you and thank you so much for, for, for your research as well as the pitch that you have prepared on, on such an important topic. Hello, nice to meet you too. <laughs> um, I have uh, Xiaomeng uh, who has prepared a question for you. Xiaomeng, you have the floor. Yes, thanks, Kelly. It's really nice talk and very interesting strategy for the diabetes treatment. I also work with biomaterials, so I have a specific question for you. So do you ever check the hosting injections of the spider, spider uh, silk 
because those external antigen spike silk itself also can use immune cells to produce antibodies. Do you think this will influence the final therapeutic result in the clinical trial? Um, yes, of course. Um, it has been already um, considered that the spider silk could have an effect on the body, but it showed really excellent biocompatibility. That means that the body accept, accepts the spider silk very nicely. And then it's also possible to biodegrade. So after some years, uh, the body will convert it and uh, you have like your own new tissue. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Kelly. And we actually also received a question from, from the audience. Um, they have retaken, of course, the, the stat that you have diabetes affecting one in out of 10 people worldwide. And indeed, the treatment that you work on is a personalized one. So the question is, how could this treatment be applied at a larger scale? And could this treatment be realistically implemented worldwide? Um, I think the treatment um, is, of course, focusing on the most severe um, types of diabetes, like type 1. So this is not, not so often uh, than all the types of diabetes. And that's why I think it's possible to um, treat the most of these um, type 1 type diabetic patients. And of course, um, it's, it's a, a personalized treatment, but it's also scalable because we can produce this um, pancreatic islets and a bioreactor, so you have a huge amount. And um, that's why I think it's uh, possible and we can, of course, have in every country. <laughs> that is certainly an a absolutely fantastic objective. And thank you so much for taking all these elements into consideration and for your work. And, and good luck in continuation, Kelly. Thanks a lot. We are now well advanced into our fifth pitch. So I now welcome you to view uh, the presentation of how Nicoleta Ciarta aims to break the wall of wastewater chemical oxidation. The video for Nicoleta, please. Imagine this apple represents all water on meth, and the seeds inside represents all freshwater resources, while only half a seed represents the amount of fresh water we actually have access to. Climate change, together with our grain demands, are causing a major stress on our water resources. So how can we deal with this crisis before it is too late? A solution is water reuse, a process of converting the wastewater into clean water that can be reused for other purposes, mainly for irrigation. To do so, we need to establish efficient and sustainable technologies, which at the same time treat the wastewater to a quality that is not toxic for the environment and the human health. But let's see what is the procedure behind the idea of water reuse. Approximately, each one of us spends 100 liters of water per day, and the majority of it ends up in the sewage system, which is connected to the wastewater treatment plant. The procedure for treating the wastewater is consistent of many different steps, and the water at the final effluent might seem clean. However, the current technologies are not sufficient to remove some organic micropollutants, such as pharmaceuticals and antibiotics. These compounds can be found in very, very low concentrations, but you can hardly remove them, and they can be bioaccumulated over time. My project now focuses on a technology, part of the final cleaning process, which is a hybrid system that combines chemical oxidation using ozone with microfiltration using ceramic membranes. We have gotten the technology to work in a simplified laboratory system with the aim to bring it up to an actual wastewater treatment plant. So now to the question, why did we choose ozone? We, when you apply your ozone, you can oxidize any compound by two ways. The first pathway is called direct oxidation. And to help you understand it, it's like having the Sylvester that tries to catch Tweety all the time, this tiny yellow bird. He has one target and he's completely obsessed about it. The second pathway is called radical oxidation. And a way to understand it is like having the Tasmanian devil that spins around super fast and it just destroys everything and anything on its way, which is what we are actually trying to achieve. We try to convert the cats into the Tasmanian devils by coating the surface of our membrane with an material. Because when you have a system where you have many Tasmanian devils running around instead of cats, it's way more efficient. 
So when you integrate this filtration step after the chemical oxidation using the ozone, we can save money by decreasing the ozone, ozone dose. We can decrease the, harmful, uh, the dangerous compounds from the wastewater and we ensure that the recycled water meets the requirements for water use. And coming back to that seed, let's take care of it, grow it, plant it and get an apple tree. Thank you. Hi, Nicoletta, lovely to meet you. And congratulations. Hi, good afternoon, for... thank you. Good afternoon, good afternoon, and congrats for both your pitch as well as, uh, as, well as your research. Uh, I, have, uh, I have Aurélie Lacroix who has just joined us now, and I know she has a very good question for you. Aurélie, please, you have the floor. Hello, Nicoletta, thanks a lot for your very nice presentation. So uh, you mentioned the coating is a nanomaterial, so I was just wondering what is it? if you can tell us, and if uh, this is something that can be easily manufactured on a larger scale. Yeah, thank you for your question. Yes, the nanomaterial is uh, what we're trying to find now. We're testing different ones. And but um, the one that they are more promising, the, the seri oxide and the titanium oxide. And we try to make a combination of both. And that's why uh, this is because the ceria and the titanium oxide, they enhance the, um, the, the, the concentration of these uh, hydroxy radicals that I said before that I compared like the Tasmanian devils. And so they decompose ozone to hydroxy radicals that they are very active species and they can break any molecule, any complex molecule that cannot be already integrated by other techniques. And um, the idea is uh, for now we are using a lab scale unit, it's a pilot plant, and uh, the size of the membranes we are using is 25 centimeters long. And to coat the membranes with this material, we are using a technique that is called soldier method. And then we use, uh, we impregnate the membrane in this soldier, and then you let it dry in the furnace at up to 500 de uh, degrees. And I guess that you need to have, because in the real scale um, unit, you have bigger membranes, like uh, they can be up to two meters long. You need to have a furnace that can fit the membrane inside. But uh, yeah, we are still in the research and development. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Good luck with, uh, with everything. Thank you. Nicoletta, actually, on, on a very similar note, we have a question from our audience, and that is, what do you think might limit our ability to scale the technology to the field? Um, so the limit, what I will say, it was, uh, it is how to modify the already commercial ceramic membranes that they have been using now in the wastewater treatment plant and uh, coat the membranes with these materials. So, mm -hmm. but I guess that uh, in an industry can provide these big furnaces to, to do these procedures. I mean, the technology is there and you can fit your technology to any um, process. I guess we have the ability to do that. Nicoletta, there's definitely a, a challenge for you to already reach out to industry to get them working on this. Yes, this is true. <laughs> Thank you so much and, and best of luck in, in continuation. Thank you so much. Um, let's now proceed to the number six pitch. And we're going to hear from Swati Nandan um, how the breaking of the wall of peripheral artery disease is going. The video, please. Have you come across someone complaining about severe pain or discomfort in their legs or arms? If so, it could be that they might be amongst the 200 million adults in the world suffering from a life-threatening condition called peripheral artery disease. It is the blockage of the arteries that carry blood to your legs and arms due to buildup of fatty deposits. And if left untreated, you could lose your legs or arms, or in severe cases, you could die. For past four decades, small mesh wire tubes called stents are placed in blocked arteries to restore blood flow. Once the blood flow is restored and the artery has healed, the stent needs to be removed from these arteries. And this is because the interaction of the stent inside the cells in your body 
leads to complications such as inflammation and blood clots. And therefore, a significant proportion of patients must undergo second surgery, which is a huge cost to the economy, to the society, and to you as the patient. So imagine a stent, also called as the bioresorbable stent, which can fully vanish inside the body after restoring blood flow, and a platform to predict the interaction of this stent coming in contact with the cells inside your body. Through my MSCA project, I am breaking the walls of peripheral artery disease at the cellular level. Using a combination of computational tools and cellular experiments, we are developing a highly bench customized benchtop platform to predict the cellular response towards stent implantation. We are 3D printing mock arteries of patients suffering from peripheral artery disease, coating them with cells to study the cellular response, which will help in overcoming complications arising due to stent implantation. This platform has the potential to revolutionize cardiovascular stent research because of its flexibility to evaluate performance of different type of stent designs in different arterial configurations. It has the capability to provide real-time cellular level understanding to scientists and clinicians, which will help in developing novel stent designs and reduce animal trials. And you know what's exciting about it? It will be the key to the development of next generation bioresorbable stents, reducing complications, requirement for second surgery, and ultimately improve the quality of lives of patients suffering from peripheral artery disease. Swati, thank you so much for, for your presentation. Lovely to meet you and thank you for, thank you for taking on such an important topic for, for us all. Uh, Themis has, has a very important question for you. Themis, please, you have the floor. Swati, thank you for your work. Indeed, we all believe we know a lot about uh, stents. We have heard about them and uh, we know they're already saving lives. But here we go a big step further. What would be for you the greatest possible achievement of the platform you're developing now? Thank you for your question. Um, the greatest achievement would be if I can optimize the design of these bioresorbable stents, which will actually help us in reducing second surgery for the patients suffering from peripheral artery disease. Um, and moreover, it will also reduce the use of animals for the initial uh, process of stent design, which is very important. So our platform is a highly customized platform, which has the capability to provide this. And if I can uh, design such a stent, it would be a big achievement for me. We hope you will achieve it. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we also have a question from, from the public, and that is, if you think your model could replace fully uh, in, in vivo studies on animals? Um, I will not say that it can fully replace because uh, it is very hard to replicate the complexity of the in vivo environment, but definitely we are trying closely to mimic the uh, conditions which are found in human peripheral arteries. So that will definitely help in providing understanding to scientists and clinicians at the cellular level and overcoming the complications. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And best of luck in continuation with your work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're now next going to speak about how is it that Alberto Camagliani is breaking the wall of nuclear gold rush. The video for Alberto, please. Hi, I am a nuclear physicist, and today I will try to show you my idea in order to answer to one of the top 11 open questions identified by a committee of physicists and astronomy. The question is where we can find gold. Unfortunately, the answer is not in two minds, so no digging tools will be used, because the answer is above our heads, deep into the universe, where all the elements that we can see every day around us have been for many years ago. But why gold? Why we are not searching for carbon 
oxygen or iron? Well, the answer is easy. We already know it. We already know where is the formation site of element up to iron. But what we don't know is where have been formed half of the element heavier than iron. And gold is one of that. So we are looking for gold and gold-like nuclei formation site. But the universe, in principle, is infinite, so we could be in front of, of a never-ending treasure hunt. Well, that's not the case, because we know that today we are in front of, of a crossroad. On one side, we have that gold and gold-like nuclei could be formed during the explosion of stars, the so-called supernova explosion, while on the other side, we have that gold could be formed during the collision of two neutron stars, the so-called neutron star merger. So how our goal is to try to find something to discriminate between these two sides. But how can we do it since we cannot go there with a spaceship and perform our experiments? We can do it if we think how gold is formed in these sides. Because the formation of gold in these sides is like the construction of a tower with wooden bricks. You start with a bunch of bricks and then you can pile up them, one on top of the other. And you can create different towers differing in shapes, size, height, and each tower will represent a nucleus. So you could have a silver tower, platinum tower, and of course golden tower. But if you exaggerate, if your tower is too high or too unstable, well, it will break, it will split and it will fall down. But that's the trick, because that's what we want. We want to reach this breakup point and we want to measure it. Because for nuclei, this breakup point is called fission. And the measurement of fission probabilities is the key ingredient in order to discriminate between the supernova site and the neutron star merger site. And the trick is that we can do it here on Earth in our laboratories, performing nuclear physics experiments. So, well, I hope that in two years, through the measurement of fission probabilities, I will find gold with nuclear physics as pickaxe and a bucket of hard work. Grazie Alberto, you, you definitely took us back in time uh, with, with at least part, parts of your research, let's say. Um, Stefan has also joined us and I know he has a very good question for you. Stefan, please, you have the floor. Well, I don't know very good, but I'm not a nuclear physicist. And I was wondering, you said it yourself, we cannot go there with spaceship. So why would you want to go and look for gold out there light years away from, from now? Why, you know, you mentioned those 11 key questions. Why, you know, why this question about finding gold in space? So Alberto, I'm I'm afraid we cannot hear you. Yeah. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Cla classic, yeah. classic lines of 2020-2021. You're on mute. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <Go> <laughs> um, I think that uh, try to find uh, an answer to this question is try to answer to the question where we come from. So it's one of really fundamental questions that we have to answer because uh, if we want to grow up as a society. We have always tried to answer to, the, to this big fundamental question. We answer in past, uh, for, for, for instance, uh, to the question, is the Earth at the center of our solar system or is it the sun? So, I mean, maybe this comparison is a little bit too ambitious, but uh, finding gold and finding the site within the universe could, be, could have the same impact, let's say. Okay, so you're not looking for gold, you're looking for the meaning of life. Maybe, why not? <laughs> it's always important. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it doesn't come as a surprise that every researcher has a philosopher at, at heart, so that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, especially if you are doing fundamental research. Yes, and I bet I actually also, also have a question from, from the audience, and I think they were more or less treading on, on, on the same sort of wavelength, and that is, what concrete implementation would this discovery pretty much have? Yeah, on the other side, uh, let's say if you are trying to really have something that we can touch in our daily life, the measurement of these fission probabilities has also an impact uh, uh, in, uh, in the energy production because these numbers can be used uh, in, um, 
nuclear reactors to produce energies. So yes, this could be a bonus of this kind of research, but let's say we are not doing that to provide these numbers in, uh, in order to, to, to help the production of energies in uh, nuclear power plants. But yes, of course, um, if there's a bonus, uh, why we shouldn't take it? Yes, definitely, and I, I, and and I mean, this is also part, core part of this of this competition is that you will hear a lot of other ideas either now or in any other context. So, definitely, I think with your piece of research, you can you can find some other some other elements and and key partners yeah, there. So, it's important to know that as well. Grazie uh, tanto, Alberto, and good luck with uh, with everything and, and with the rest of your research. Thank you. And Thank now we proceed. To, to, to the last pitch just ahead of our break. Um, there is pitch number eight on uh, breaking the wall of cerebellar neuroscience. And now we will listen to Julia Rocco talk about her piece of research. I have a little test for you. I know it is a video, but I want you to actually do it. Put one hand on the palm of the other end and turn it over, back and forth, quicker and quicker. It is fine? If the answer is yes, I have good news for you. Your cerebellum is working well. Yes, I said cerebellum, not brain, as you might expect. The red thing in the back of the head is the cerebellum, or little brain. It's the place where all of your thoughts and actions get refined and quality controlled. What if there is a damage? Someone with a deficit in the cerebellum, if we go back to the initial exercise, would have reduced coordination and end up turning one hand on the top of the other one. But more than that, it can cause also troubles in language, communication, as shown here. It is even involved in Alzheimer's disease and multiple sclerosis. It's surprising. But despite all that, it has received significant attention only during the last few years. The question is, what tools are available to examine it? The only tool we have now is the functional MRI. You see the big scanner here with a two-tones magnet. It is good for sure sophisticated, but it has a couple of drawbacks. First, the subject must stay still in a narrow and noisy environment. Then the device is expensive, we are talking about millions. Last but not least, three quarters of humanity lacks access to medical imaging. This is why we thought about using something more accessible, light. How? We place sensors on the skin above the cerebellum and we illuminate it with thin lasers. The light interacts with proteins in the red blood cells and allows to figure out the color change in blood when it is carrying oxygen versus when it is not. And this is exactly one way to measure the neural activity. In fact, more oxygenated blood means activation. If we combine this with recording electrodes, the same kind we use for heart monitoring, we obtain a compact, flexible and affordable technology to explore the cerebellum. By making it portable, we will collect much more data in daily life situations to find out the role of the cerebellum and at the same time revolutionize the approach to diagnosis and monitoring. Basically, we are saying that a huge million dollar MRI machine could be replaced by a couple of cheap sensors the size of a fingernail, enabling better, faster and cheaper approaches to cerebellar neuroscience. Thank you so much, Julia, for, for your presentation and your work. Uh, Mustafa, I think you have a question for Julia. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, my question would be, from an MRI, uh, we can see the anatomical and morphological changes, even have a 3D rec uh, reconstruction of the structure. Opposed to that, what real life benefit you are proposing in terms of diagnosis and prognosis? Yes, it's more about the monitoring and diagnostic in daily life because the fMRI is uh, an ideal environment and it doesn't allow to perform tasks that we perform in daily life, like uh, motor tasks and uh, other cognitive activities. So 
the benefit of this new technology would be to examine the cerebellum in uh, real life situations, which is currently not possible in fMRI. Thank you very much. Thanks, yeah. thanks a lot. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, and Julia, I actually have a question from our audience. Um, and, and Mustafa also alluded, of course, to, to, to the comparison with MRI. How reliable is your technique in comparison to, to MRI? Okay, at, at the moment, we are at a very preliminary stage. So we are assessing the feasibility to use this technique and the results are very good. So in this moment, we are focusing on detecting um, hemispherical activation. So uh, as uh, in analogy with the brain, we have functions that are controlled by hemispheres, like motor function or cognitive functions, and they are lateralized. So in this moment, we are at a stage in which we detect which hemisphere is activated with respect to which function. And we are capable to do that with the technology. For sure, a, ch a challenge for the future is to define uh, until which resolution we can reach with the technology. Thank you so much, Julia, and, and best of luck with this. It, it's definitely a great a groundbreaking work and, and good luck in continuation. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, dear ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, with Julia's presentation, we have now reached uh, half of our pitches. Actually, we've had a little bit more than, than half. Uh, now it's time for us all to take a bit of break, and I would say also to reconsult our notes. Uh, I would like to welcome you back here at 4.10 uh, CET time, Brussels time. Um, in the meantime, please definitely have another think at, at the pieces of research that you have. And in case you have not yet registered on the platform, please do so right now so that you have a chance to one, ask questions, and then two, also to vote. Just a reminder, the vote is going to be open at 4.45 p.m., so just in, in, in less than 45 minutes. So definitely please, um, please register now so that you have this time. So see you all back at 4.10. Thank you.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back uh, to the Falling Walls Lab MSCA competition. Um, I hope you all had a very good break and you already got the chance to scribble down some extra, extra notes from the presentations that you have heard. They might inspire you in your work. They might inspire you to find some other colleagues that could support your work. Uh, so hopefully you can find a lot of, a lot of benefits from being with us. Um, as a quick reminder, please make sure that if you're following us on live stream, whether it's online, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, do also register on the platform for the competition because this will enable you to one, ask questions to our uh, researchers as well as uh, to be able to vote for your favorite pitch and your favorite um, presentation just in, in a little while. To confirm, we are going to open the vote just at the end of the second round of presentations at 4.45 p.m. CET, and the vote will be open until 5.10 p.m. So you will not have that much time to cast your vote. So please already register on your platform now and uh, do bear in mind who your preferred one, uh, who your preferred researchers already from the first round of pitches are, as well as uh, tune in for the second round. With no further ado, uh, I would like to declare open the second round of, of our pitches. And we're ready to go with uh, the next pitch which is going to bring us a little bit into the world of data interoperability. And we're going to hear from Jada Lali on how is it that she is breaking the, the wall of data interoperability in healthcare. The video, please. Do you care about your family? I do. Once my grandma got robbed while she was walking around with a spare necklace and a guy just tried to steal one of the beds, breaking the wall necklace. Well, even though we do not notice, this is what happens to us on a daily basis, not with our purse, but with something much more valuable, our health data. Now, just imagine that my grandma was actually wearing little blocks of data around her neck. This is not a difficult image to picture. After all, we create, exchange and collect data all the time. Our heart rate, how much we sleep, our blood pressure, basic features for our smartwatches, our smartphones, nowadays connected to our laptops too. Now, dwell for a moment on the last of these actions, the exchange of that data. What you do to keep your jewelry safe is to exchange your low security level, like keeping them in a jewelry box at home, for a higher security level, the safe of the bank. Back to our data. What if I told you that the best way to protect and make the most of your data was actually to exchange it? Well, after creating the data, we are used to collect and store it where nobody else can touch it, generating a phenomenon known as data ceiling. We keep it metaphorically in our own home, home, thinking it's safe that way. But what if it's our fault that we get robbed? And what if we are responsible for helping thieves robbing us and also others by not addressing the right level of security? This is where blockchain technology comes in. If the role of keeper is endowed to each single block of data, then any subsequent test from the whole chain, or what was more, will be immediately exposed. Each block of data is connected through a unique hash to all others in a chain, and removing one piece results in breaking the whole chain. The test itself may be successful, yet the thief has no clue what their block refers to. Since the blockchain infrastructure rendered, it's functionally useless. So the test failed. In other words, with blockchain technology, we build a reliable system that protects us and makes any stolen data unusable, so less attractive. What's the point of stealing something that cannot be used? If we learn how to share and protect this data, we can start thinking about using it and make that exchange among health institutes possible. Then we are no longer thieves or victims, but we become health pioneers. Hi, Devine. Lovely to meet you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. 
Did I have Xiaoming that has a question for you? Xiaoming, please, you have the floor. Hi, Sylvia. Thanks very much for your nice presentations. And I think your project is really promising, consider current situation pandemic, because I already see the importance of data sharing across the world. So my question is, what's your opinions about the major obstacle currently confronted with us to establish a good collaboration of sharing data systems among different countries? Uh, yes. The first problem uh, is about GDPR, because basically we are talking about regulations that applies to data. And the second problem relates to the trust. But the point is that if we build up a very trusted system um, using those two philosophies and those two different technologies, which are the federated learning and the blockchain technology, we can totally overcome the problem of the trust, because if you cannot trust another person, you at least have to trust the system. And if you build up such a system, you can also give out a protocol um, that will um, allow you three levels of uh, GDPR protection. So the general level, so the protection that everybody wants. The second level, which is location related. So somebody uh, decides the type of GDPR, the type of um, security level he wants to be a applied to his data based on where he's logging from. And the third level is specific GDPR for some data types that um, needs further protection and further the identification of the patient as such as HIV data. They are very sensitive. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Jada, thank thank you so much. So much. I, I actually also have a question in addition to Xiao Meng's that, that we received from the audience, and that is how useful and applicable is blockchain in practice, notably in the healthcare environment? Okay, uh, actually, uh, the point is that uh, many people does not really know um, how blockchain works. So I can feel the concern from the coming from the question, but uh, the blockchain is really very applicable because it's very flexible. And as the name uh, of the technology already says, it's formed, it's built up of many blocks and it has many features. So you just need to choose or select the feature that uh, you prefer. The point is that, having the blockchain in place will give you options because you can also use reactive workflow frameworks and uh, programming SDL in order to uh, imp implement and integrate it with other technologies. So it's very flexible, it's very useful and applicable in many different fields. And we have chosen healthcare because the healthcare system is very fragmented. Absolutely. I think it's a universal problem at a global level, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely. I approached this project exactly during the pandemic, and we used the as case of study um, SARS-CoV-2 data. So, yeah. Jada, thank you so much for, for your work, and best of luck in continuation. Thank you so much. Bye. Uh, we'll now head off uh, to the world of bioplastics. And Milica Milic is going to take us how is going to take us through her research of how is it that she's breaking the wall of, of bioplastics. If you opened any news website this summer, all you could see were devastating floods in Germany, horrible forest fires all across Turkey and Greece, and devastating droughts in South America. The UN issued a report on climate change and called all of what is happening code red for humanity. All of this is the direct consequence of how we treat our planet. And we know that we're not doing a great job. It's old news that we use a ton of plastic every day. And now I know what you're gonna say, but I'm using a reusable water bottle. I switched to paper straws. True, but have you been to the supermarket lately? You buy six apples plus a cubic meter of packaging. The material we're using for this is called PET, and it's hardly an ideal candidate. The result of its use are trillions of microplastic particles floating in Earth's waters. And by 2050, there will be more plastic than fish in our sea. We try to get rid of this waste by burning it, and we create so much CO2 that we're drilling another gaping hole in the ozone layer. Also, every year, we use 350 million tons of oil derivatives to produce PET. 
But let's be realistic. Simply giving up our commodity is not something most people can easily do. The solution is to change the way we make our chemicals and do this fast. What we can do is create new alternative green and sustainable materials. Ideally, such a material would be made from renewable sources in an environmentally friendly way and be or have the potential to become cheap. So how do we turn this around and still keep our commodity? By using PEF, a material made from a chemical called FDCA. And this is how we do it. If you think about wood industry and its remnants and also food waste, these are essentially trash. But they contain simple sugars that are not that different to the sugar that you put in your tea. And from this, we can make HMF. Now this is where nature comes in and brings a solution in the form of enzymes. Enzymes are tiny proteins which are part of the majority of processes on Earth. From making cheese, baking bread, to helping us grow, enzymes are everywhere. Usually found in plants and bacteria, they are non-toxic and they love water. They work in mild temperatures, so very little energy is used for heating. We can connect them to a solid support and then we can easily remove them and reuse them. Inexpensive, no harsh chemicals, no high temperatures. By combining science and engineering, we can create a high throughput cascade for production of FDCA. Not to mention potentially revolutionize the materials we use in our everyday lives and help our planet just a tiny bit. Milica, thank you so much for, for your work uh, and for actually calling on, on, on all of us to um, sort of look differently at uh, in the way we consume and the things that we, we certainly buy. As you can see, Aurelie has also joined us and Aurelie has a question for you. Please, Aurelie, you have the floor. Hello, Milika. Thanks a lot for your very nice presentation. So I understand that there is a huge advantage in using PEF, right, over PET in terms of manufacturing and production. Uh, and I was wondering whether there is any advantage in terms of recycling, uh, if it's biodegradable or something. Um, yeah. So essentially, PEF is 100% recyclable, and it is more biodegradable than PET, but if you think about it, you don't really want a plastic bottle to be completely biodegradable. So I have a plastic bottle, I put orange juice in it, and in the morning, it's a puddle of juice. So essentially, it does bring about the uh, advantages in recyclability and biode biodegradability, definitely. Yeah, I guess it depends like the timelines of degradation, I guess, of the plastic. Very interesting. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Thank you, Milica. We received a question also from, from the audience, and that is, aren't these solutions as pervasive as traditional materials if disposed improperly? And they might have similar negative effects on biodiversity. What are your thoughts? I mean, uh, if we think of anything, literally anything in this world, nothing is either good or bad. However, um, disposing trash is another problem that we should think about, which we do in our homes if you're separating your trash and putting it to recycle. But what I am addressing in my project is kind of uh, solving the origin of the problem, not the consequence. But definitely, this is something that should be uh, explored. But from what I know, PEF is definitely not as toxic as PET. Hvala Milica and best of luck in, in continuation. Thank you so much. We're now uh, stepping into, into a bit of a different world and Pierre Depping is going to tell us how is it that he is breaking the wall of curing iron channel driven diseases. The video please. When was the last time you took an ibuprofen? It's quite convenient, right? A couple of pills a day and the pain is away. After a day or two, our body has recovered and we just continue our life. But what if the pain has not gone away? What if it comes back over and over and over again, becomes unbearable to the point where the normal dosage of pain reliever is not enough and you can't live without it anymore? Chronic pain is only one of the many diseases caused by iron channels. Other prominent examples are autoimmune disorders or epilepsy, that affect millions of people. 
Why is it so difficult to treat diseases caused by ion channels? Well, the reason for this is that so many similar looking ion channels are involved in crucial body functions. For example, muscle contraction or the beating of our heart. The problem now is that conventional drugs do not only target the channels that are involved in the disease, but also the channels that are important for those body functions, ultimately leading to side effects. What you don't want is, is to cause severe heart problems to the patient while treating their chronic pain or their epilepsy. There's a huge unmet need of novel therapeutics that are highly potent, highly selective against their target and have a long lifetime in our body. Potent so that they are as effective as possible. Select, uh, selective so that we get less side effects and a long lifetime so that they can be applied less frequently. Both types of drugs would open new doors for novel therapies against neurological, pain-related, autoimmune disorders, disorders that are currently untreated. With a not-body technology, we want to achieve exactly this. In nature, you find the most effective ion channel blockers in venoms coming from scorpions or spiders. Over millions of years of evolution, a vast toolbox has been created of so-called mini-proteins, also called knottins. We take those knottins and fuse them into the surface of human antibodies. The human antibodies we can engineer so that, they are, so that they are selective enough so that they only target one channel and not the other. In addition, they have an increased lifetime. Basically, what we are doing is, we are learning from nature but improving it with modern biotechnology. What does that mean for our chronic pain treatment? The patient would now only get injections every few weeks. That would impact their life heavily because they would not have any side effects at all. Not bodies have the potential to improve the life of millions of people. Thank you very much. Hi, Peren. Thank you so much for, for your work. Uh, Themis, I believe you have a question for, for Pet. Please, you have the floor. Hello, Peren. Thank you for your presentation. We've just uh, tried to discover how notins can be used to overcome chronic pain. But could you tell us a bit more about how you came to notins and also why do notins seem to be the valuable option against chronic pain? So if you think about um, where the knottings are actually coming from. They are coming, for example, I don't know, for, from scorpions or even from snakes, which are trying to paralyze in, in normal life. They're trying to paralyze their victims. And this paralyzation is nothing else than those knottings to bind to those ion channels, thereby the signals coming from our nerves, I don't know, from our hand, for example, to our brain. Those channels are being blocked so that the signal is getting, not getting coming, to, uh, not can be transduced through the body anymore. And this is what people saw. They tried to understand it and found out that those knottings can actually block ion channels. And there's where the idea is coming from. They found out that also these ion channels are involved in diseases. And now they're like, okay, cool. We have a molecule that can go against the ion channels. Let's just take it and make them, well, and use it for our purpose now. Use it for healing people instead of paralyzing them, of course. Sounds clear to me. Thank you. Thank you. And definitely turning something really painful into something curing is, is absolutely uh, an element that we would we would all desire. And actually, your presentation also sparked a, a question from one of our members of audience. And the question is, does the use of not bodies need to be targeted to each patient? I would say it depends a bit on disease and disease. Um, there are so many different ion channels out there and also so many different diseases. So one would have to think now, is it actually working or not on every patient? At the moment, I would say, if it's the same ion channel, it should work. But the body is such a complex thing. There are so many, or also the cells are working a little bit differently from patient to patient. It might be that not every patient can be treated. This Thank needs you to be so tested. Much. This needs to be tested. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for all your work and best of luck. Thank you. We'll now proceed with Sofia Garcia Frazar, who is going to tell us how she's breaking the wall of immersive training in chemical industry. 
Many of us have might heard this famous phrase, tell me and I will forget, show me and I might remember, involve me and I will learn. But it's not always possible to involve the learners in any kind of learning situation. Or is it, what if I tell you that the future of learning is here now? The chemical industry is extremely important in our daily lives. But over the past 100 years, disasters have led to the death of 10,000 people with almost 2 million affected. One of the main contributing factors of the disasters is human error. But don't worry, dangerous processes can be operated safely. One key to this is advanced training of chemical operators. Of course, we already do that, but those trainings have certain limitations. Training of emergency situations such as chemical spillages of explosions are impossible to do in the workplace because they are too dangerous. Supervisors need to guide the training and detect mistakes, but many times they are outnumbered by the trainees, which makes it inefficient. Finally, there is a lack of motivation and engagement. Training sessions include high amount of information which may make the learning long and tedious. That's why I'm doing research on how we can improve traditional training in the chemical industry with immersive technologies, such as virtual or augmented reality. We have conducted a comparison study between pilot plan training and virtual reality training. As a result, we had the first indications that the knowledge acquired in virtual reality is transferable to pilot plans. Now we are designing a virtual reality prototype in which the operator and you will be able to operate a chemical reactor. This prototype includes dangerous emergency situations and the operator will need to take decisions to solve the problem. And if not, they will be able to see the consequences of their own actions, being all completely safely in an office. We will also include assessment elements and learning analytics that will provide real-time feedback to the user. Now, the operator will know immediately if they have made a mistake and if they don't know what the next step in the procedure is, they could receive hints. We will also include game-based learning elements to increase the motivation and engagement. In conclusion, instead of a less effective training, with the help of virtual reality, we can now redesign training sessions to be more efficient, more motivating and more effective. Hi, Sophia, and thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Stefan, I believe you, you have a question for Sophia. Please, you have Yeah, absolutely, question. because I mean, I knew about flight simulators, but now you're telling me about simulators for the chemical industry. But from what you said, I mean, this has, you know, implications for all sectors. So how applicable and transposable is this for uh, any other uh, industrial sector or, you know, even why not at universities, for example, uh, to train people uh, in the lab virtually, for example? Yes, um, of course. So thank you very much for your question. This is actually really important. Um, many industries are using this technology to train their employees. For example, in, in surgeons, you already use this technology to train difficult surgeries, for example. Um, also for fire training of fire uh, brigades. And um, my project also is developing training tools with virtual reality and augmented reality for laboratories, um, for university students, for high school students. And not, it's not only for the industry. My, my project, my, my specific prototype is for the industry, but we have a various amount of different ages which this technology can be applied and improve the training in all type of um, industries and yes, and ages. Wow, cool. Well, I wish I had that when I worked in biotech or in university back then. So uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah exactly. If I, if I, it's never too late, never too late. <laughs> Uh, Sophia, we also received a question from the audience and, and they were wondering whether any of your immersive trainings, whether they have been uh, put into practice by any chemical companies and uh, they were curious, what was the result if such a training has been put in practice? Yes, actually, um, I'm working in the chemical company Merck in Germany. 
And we have tested one prototype in in the year 2019 and 2020, and those were the results that we got that the, the, the knowledge acquired in virtual reality is transferable to the real plant operations. And now on Monday, we will start a, a test with real chemical operators on our prototype, and we will test this with 200 operators from the chemical industry. And then we will go to France to test it in the chemical company Arkema, and then we will go to Belgium and test it in, in the training chemical company called ACTA. So we will have a, a lot of data to publish maybe in the beginning of next year. Well, best of luck. Clearly, you have a lot of a lot of projects already set in motion. So, so good luck with that. And definitely please report back on, on what, what results you've achieved with these guys. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you. I'll now invite you to join me back into the world of healthcare, and we will hear from Dr. Laya Rosa Cuyere. Um, how is it that she's breaking the wall of targeted cancer treatment? The video, please. We all know someone who has suffered from cancer. And after chemotherapy, we usually picture them as someone who's lost their hair, looks pale, looks sick. We accept that cancer treatment leads to side effects while we don't for other diseases. A big limitation of current treatments is that they struggle to differentiate between cancer cells and healthy cells. Antiproliferative drugs can kill those cells that are rapidly growing, like those in the tumor, but also our hair follicles, skin, blood cells. Another limitation is that we cannot control exactly where and when a drug will have its biological effect. And so after administration, the drug will diffuse all around our body, giving the desired effect in the tumor, but also in other tissues, therefore giving those well-known severe side effects. Scientists have been trying for decades to find drugs that are more selective for cancer cells by modifying the chemical structure, the therapeutic target, the mechanism of action. But what if I told you that the solution could be to use light? We are working on a field called photopharmacology, where drugs can change their structure and therefore their biological activity by illuminating them with light of a particular color and intensity, giving us full control of their therapeutic effect in space and time. The idea is that the drug will be administered in its inactive form, and it will only become active upon illumination of only the tumor area therefore achieving elimination of the tumor without effects in the rest of the body. In my MSCA individual fellowship, I'm establishing an in vitro proof of concept of this idea. I am firstly modifying known anti-cancer drugs to make them light responsive. Secondly, I'm evaluating their photochemical properties, such as the light color and intensity required to activate them. And thirdly, I'm testing their biological activity in commercial cancer cells and patient samples. To further progress this technology into clinical studies, we plan to bring together medicinal chemists and biologists who design and test these molecules, engineers who develop new light delivery methods, and clinicians. We are wrecking the wall of targeted cancer treatment by proposing a new therapy that is not just an improvement, but also one that could completely revolutionize how cancer is treated in the clinic in a more effective, longer lasting and much safer way. Laia, thank you so much for your presentation and for your research. Uh, Aurélie has, has prepared a question for you. Aurélie, please. Hello, Laya. So thank you for your presentation. I work on very similar topics, so it's always nice to hear uh, the different progress. Uh, so I had a question regarding the use of light. So I guess like it, we know it can't go through all tissues and reach all organs, right? So do you have any plan uh, to do this? Or maybe you can explain a bit more the challenge to the general audience. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We actually the permeability, both the permeability, like how deep it can go into the tissues, and also how toxic the light might be for our tissues, depends on the light wavelength or the color of light that we need to activate the molecules. So the truth is that 
making molecules that get activated with UV light happens to be much easier than designing molecules that get activated at longer wavelengths, which are more permeable. So one of the things that we need to achieve now is to optimize the molecules that we have to, so that they get activated with lights of, of higher wavelength and therefore higher penetration. So yeah, this is one of the big challenges we have actually. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you for your answer. Laya, I, I have a question from, from our audience, um, and that is that we're wondering how easily would this targeted treatment be implemented by, by practitioners? So, well, it will be easier when we actually, so at the moment we are in very early stages, like we're doing the development of the drugs, we're developing the, we're assessing their activity in vitro, we still have to progress to in vivo, optimize or develop new devices for activation, for application of light. But the idea is that we want to find something that doesn't make it much difficult for clinicians to, to treat the patients, of course. At the moment, there are already different therapies that use light, like photodynamic therapy, which is used in the, in the clinic. Photopharmacology has some advantages respect to uh, PDT, photodynamic therapy, that I won't get into. But, the, but what I want to say here is that there, this is already being done in the clinic, like the fact of applying light and this is being done routinely. So we envisage that even if we have to de develop new medical devices, it's not going to be a big struggle for the clinicians to adopt this therapy. Maya, thank you so much and good luck with, with this application. Thanks a lot. We'll now go into the world of climate and Deborah Tangunan will tell us how is it that she's breaking the wall of past climates. The latest IPCC assessment report shows that the global surface temperature from 2011 to 2020 was 1.09 degrees Celsius higher than in 1850 to 1900, which is the interval used as the pre-industrial baseline. Atmospheric carbon dioxide levels in 2019 were also reported to be higher than at any time in the past, at least over the last 2 million years. These changes have a wide range of economic, environmental, and social consequences that will persist as temperature rises, including shortage of food and drinking water, greater damage to infrastructure caused by stronger typhoons and wildfires, and collapse of biodiversity and ecosystem resilience. But the question is, can we still reverse these changes? Our research investigates the impact of past climate change on the marine ecosystem. Did you know that there are organisms on Earth that you may not know exist, but play a critical role in our planet and in our daily lives? These microscopic calcifying algae called coccolithophores are the focus of our research. They are one of the main groups of phytoplankton and are considered to be the base of the marine food web. Coccolithophores are tiny and you cannot see them with your two naked eyes. Imagine a strand of your hair they are 10 times smaller than that, so it looks like they do not really exist. But did you know that they have been around since 230 million years ago? That's way long before humans came into existence, and therefore they had a first-hand experience of past climatic changes. They have been there through extreme cold and extreme warm conditions for over millions of years. We are investigating an unprecedented suite of long marine sediment sequences representing million-year history of past climates and use a combination of physical and geochemical parameters that, for the first time, provide a comparison to past atmospheric carbon dioxide levels, present ecosystem function, and integrate this data into a modeling framework. With this data, we can predict the potential future response of marine organisms to climate change and break the wall of future design of evidence-based monitoring, mitigation, and management strategies of the marine ecosystem and the environment as a whole. The best way of predicting the future, they say, is by studying the past. And in this case, something as tiny as a phytoplankton could help in solving something as big and challenging as climate change. Okay. 
Deborah, thank you so much for your presentation. And you're you're absolutely right. Uh, the best way forward to, to understanding and uncovering the issues of the future is definitely also analyzing and learning from the past, I think. It's a lesson we should all remember. Um, Xiaomek, I think you have a question for Deborah. Uh, for Deborah, please, you have the floor. Yeah. Thanks, De Deborah. It's a really interesting project. And my question is, Compared with studying the carbon dioxide levels in the organic substance, so like, like the ice in the Antarctic, because as I know, it's the normal, ma normal methods to investigate this field. So what's the advantage of your technologies to studying the marine organisms? Yeah, so we actually, so there's this uh, ice core that we compare our data with. And the good thing about the studying the organisms is that it's already the organism. So this is one of the uh, important uh, part of our research that we, we are able to explore the link between the marine organisms and climate change. So the data that we will get from this will be used to compare it to this, uh, to this other data from the past and then integrate it to the data from, uh, integrate it with other data to be able to put it into the modeling uh, framework. And then from that, we, can, we will be able to, to predict the, uh, what, what will happen in the, in the future. Thank you. Deborah, one member of the audience um, has, uh, has, a, has a question for you, and that is, can you name one concrete impact of your research to tackle or stop climate change? Yeah, that's a very difficult question. It's actually one of, all, one of the things that I always ask myself whenever I do these things. So the challenge for us uh, physical scientists working on this type of research, basic experimental analytical uh, research, is that we don't actually bring to the table a, a concrete solution on how to stop climate change, because we know that our climate has changed in the past. It is currently changing and it will continue to change in the future. And it is everyone's task to at least slow it, uh, slow down its effect. So what our research actually contributes is the knowledge, evidence-based, science-based knowledge that we add to the table in order for policymakers, um, decision makers to provide solutions on this uh, pressing issue that our world is uh, currently facing. Deborah, thank you so much. And you're absolutely right. We all need to, to, to take a, a, a fair share of that. Thank you and best of luck in, in your project. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I am um, both delighted as well as a bit sad because now we're getting to the last pitch that we're going to hear today. Uh, so Vivek Babu will have not that all the easy task to conclude the round of pitches and he's going to tell us how he's breaking the wall of wildlife extinction. Like everyone, I love nature and I like to visit wildlife sanctuaries to see all those animals. But have you ever thought about a future where you go with your child or grandchild and just stare onto those empty lands? Isn't that scary? The extinction of wild animals has accelerated. We have lost more species in the past 50 years than a million years ago. This is due to the rising human population that drives urbanization and results in loss of biodiversity. Sadly, we are all part of it. On the bright side, we have several success stories in restoring the endangered species like the reintroduction of water buffaloes in Eastern Europe or the mountain gorillas in Uganda. This was possible by carefully monitoring their behavior in natural environment. Researchers use tracking system as one of their best tool to remotely collect the animal position, environmental and ecological data to study their habitat. However, one of the main drawback is that they use multiple batteries, which makes them bulky, heavy, and is not even suitable on mounting to many animals. In order to find out a solution to this problem, we collaborated with WWF Ukraine and Poland in order to develop a solar power tracking system. I am a physicist doing research on perovskite-based solar cells. Now you might be wondering what is perovskite and how it is even related. Let me explain. Any class of material that has the same crystal structure as shown in this image can be considered as perovskite. 
over the past decade, perovskites were used as an absorbing material in solar cell and was able to reach an efficiency from low 3% to over 25% in a short period of time. What interests me most is the ability to manufacture perovskite-based solar cells from an ink or a solution. In laboratories, we deposit by spraying, printing, or even you can paint it on any surface. Now, I like to show you a perovskite module that we have fabricated in Saule. You can see how flexible it is and how thin it is onto the plastic foil. Considering all these amazing features, we developed perovskite-powered animal tracking collar for monitoring the European bisons in Ukraine. By integrating, we were able to reduce the weight, extend the lifetime, and also reduce the cost of it. In this image, you will find Eva happily living in the forestry with our solar power tracking collar. I also like to mention that as a result of the long-term conservation work by WWF, European bisons are no longer considered as a vulnerable species, and we are happy to be a part of it. By this, we are breaking the wall of wildlife extinction. Thank you for listening to my talk, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Vivek, thank you so much, and also for taking on the, the work to fight wildlife extinction. Uh, I know you have absolutely activated our, our uh, jury. Mustafa has a question for you. Uh, thank you for the great work, Vivek. Uh, my question is this tracking collar. It works for the larger animal. What about the smaller animal, like birds or squirrels? And for the longer period of time, would it be able to track? Yeah, so thank you for your question. It's very interesting. So. The first prototype we obviously tried on the larger uh, bisons, like a huge beast where you have larger surface for collecting a lot of areas. And the next one we are trying on to the birds, which basically you can put it on to the tracking, which is small. And also I like to uh, mention that since it is flexible and it is lightweight, you can really uh, fit it onto any kind of shapes of the tracking system. You are not constrained to the to the, the electronic system. You can basically put it on to the, any curves or, in, or to any shapes. And also, um, yeah, this is about the uh, different animal types we can go with. That's great to hear, thank you. Thank you, Vivek. And I have a question from a member of the audience, uh, and that is, does the use of perovskite cells ensure enough power for the tracking systems to transmit the data to researchers and conservationists? So I, I can even give you the example from this project. We used, uh, we used a LoRaWAN technology, and the power that is used for transmitting the data is one milliwatt. And the of power that we are generating from the solar panel is 400 milliwatt, which is 400 times more than the power which is required. We just keep it in order also to study uh, the technology because perovskites is completely a new and the research have already done over 10 years. So to really see what is the real world application also, we, we really, so for example, these tracking colors can go beyond 10 years in principle. Thank you so much. You clearly thought about it all. We can definitely see that. So thank you and yes. best of luck. And, and please you. never, never drop this important work. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, with the next presentation, uh, we conclude um, this year's round of pitches. And I have the great honor to declare the opening of the votes for you all. You have time until 510 uh, Brussels time to cast your vote. So please don't forget to register on the platform and cast your vote there. Uh, we will be closing the, the vote at 510. You definitely have the chance to choose the winner of the um, of, of the prize of the of the public. Uh, whilst the jury will take time right now to uh, go through all of their notes from the pitches that they have heard and the answers that, that the researchers have provided. Uh, and they will be back with us at um, around 5.15 to communicate uh, their results. And then in the meantime, we will also see what is it that you, the public, have decided. So please do so now, register on the platform and cast your votes. In the meantime, um, I uh, want to also give you a quick reminder of which were the 15 contestants that we have seen today. I think we have a, a slide with all of the all of our contestants. Um, they have 
taken us through absolutely so many fields of, of research with applicability in our day-to-day uh, -day lives, um, things that will improve our lives, save our lives even, as well as protect um, our, our, our society as we know it. So thank you to all these absolutely brilliant um, 15 researchers. And thank you for taking on the challenge of actually getting to, to pitch all of their ideas and to answer your grilling questions and those of the jury. Uh, we now have a great surprise for you all. We have uh, decided to invite one of the uh, previous winners of the Falling Walls Lab uh, MSCA competition, and that is the 2009 edition winner, uh, Emmanuel Salifu. Hi, Emmanuel. How are you doing? Hi, Raluca. Thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. If you don't mind, I'll just remind um, our audience what is it that um, you currently do, and then we'd love to hear from you um, into what are your fields of research right now, because uh, you you took us into a very beautiful area back in 2019, but I'm not curious whether you have progressed with that research. Um, so Emmanuel, you have recently took uh, up an offer as a presidential postdoctoral fellow uh, at the School of Sustainable Engineering and Built Environments. Uh, and that's part of the Arizona State University in the United States. Yeah. Um, but prior to this, right, you were a research associate at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, UK, which yeah. I think you're still in Glasgow. So COVID has has kept you on the island. Yeah, lots of advantages from, from COVID and lots of challenges as well. You know, we have the online sessions due to COVID now, of course, getting used to that. Not so good, but yeah, and also travel issues. So yes, I'm still in Glasgow uh, currently due to travel restrictions, but I am meant to already start at Arizona State University. Could you tell us a little bit in, in a minute or so, what are your fields of research and, yeah. and what is it that you've been working on uh, lately? Yes, I'm still working on the same uh, research I presented in 2019. It's an interesting one. I mean, it's it's won me the award, so I shouldn't stop, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I'm working on exactly improving the soils, uh, the soils under us. You know, it's a problem. We, we're losing soils, but we tend to forget because it's covered up with... Uh, concrete and other hazardous materials and so we forget that we're actually losing the soils that give us food that are also connected to issues of flood and water pollution and all and so i am using sustainable methods essentially i'm using mushrooms you know to help improve the soil to help retain the soil bind them together and avoid the um, soil erosion reduce the uh, desertification and other such land degradation problems that we have so that's the research i'm still working on uh, currently, even at uh, Arizona State University, where we have a center for biomediated uh, geotechnics, which essentially is uh, the leading center for using these kind of technologies to improve the environment. And Emmanuel, you you are an MSCA fellow. Can you tell us a bit what is it that being being an MSCA fellow helped you in your research? as well as especially this type of competition, because I know we, and we got the chance to meet in 2019. It's yeah. a fantastic experience where you guys, you even go through training to prepare for these pitches. How, how has this had an impact on your research? Yes, I, I'll start with the first question. Being an MSCA uh, fellow, you know, I, I was in the international training networks as a PhD student, early stage researcher. And I think it's one of the most memorable experiences of my life uh, because it, it sort of gave me a very unique, we're like the elite PhD students, you know, among other PhD students. Apologies to everyone, but it, it, the, the MSCA funding and program gives us a, a kind of good start from the onset with career development plans because it's focused on training, you know, and networking. And the fact that you're launched into a network of um, lots of researchers. For me, I had 15 other co-researchers, co-PhD students who had their own uh, supervisors. So look at 30 people, for instance, 30 established experts, and all of us at our own level relating together for every six months throughout the entire three years of, the, of my project. It was an awesome network. And going from that, in that network, I've also, I continue to, to relate with them till date. And um, I've got some job offers and invitations to, you know, work with them in different places across Europe, even across the world at this point. Uh, and we're all growing together at that stage. Participating in the Falling Walls Lab, uh, your second question, also, you know, put me out in the limelight, I would say, because, you know, here I was working in the lab, 
getting carried away with my research and thinking that's all there is to the world. And then the opportunity to just come out and talk about it in a way that people can relate to it. You know, the challenge of even preparing the story uh, was a big issue, but coming to the, the program, being shortlisted was great. And uh, the training we got, uh, uh, the MS, the organizers actually gave us a debatrix kind of coaches who helped us uh, develop the story and, you know, get through to all the techniques that are behind that we never understand if you're staying all in the lab or in the field or carried away with your research. And that was quite helpful. It was a TED style kind of, you know, teaching. And uh, it's an additional skill set that I've also uh, received. And it's awesome because on my profile, for instance, I see that exceptionality. And this is the idea of it to make us more employable you know, in the future. And that has worked wonders for me greatly because I think I see how different and how my, my own profile stands out when I go for other jobs and other competitions. And at the back of this, I've also won a couple of other prizes from participating in other competitions. I've got invitations to different uh, forum to, to give talks and presentations about my research. And so it's all really awesome. Uh, it's a great experience, a memorable one for me. And Emmanuel, I know you also got the chance to speak to some um, to some policymakers, didn't you? Oh, yeah. That's exactly as you said, getting you out of your lab and you realize that, okay, listen, for me, in order to implement my piece of project, I need to also move around the practical side of things, but also exactly. of course, policy needs to follow that. So how, how did that go? Yes, I mean, you're very correct. Um, research, we, we get to we get carried away, you know, as researchers in our little world, thinking that it all starts and ends there. And sometimes we also feel like everyone understands what we're doing already, you know, in the jargon and the way we present it typically. You know, participating in the Falling Walls Lab, uh, like I said, brought me out and helped me present it better. And that also brought some attraction to the policymakers, the general public out there who are keen to know what we are doing. And they're keen to see us communicating to them in a language they can understand and relate to. And that's what I experienced. For instance, I, I was uh, invited. Uh, thankfully, that uh, Timis, the Director General of the uh, Directorate for Youth Sports Education and Culture, was present on the day of my presentation and the day I won the prize. And uh, I was invited to the away day of the Directorate General. Uh, and it was a very, very awesome experience as well. I had to share my research with about 400 persons in the room, you know, policymakers, senior policymakers, uh, uh, you know, of the, the Directorate. And it was quite interesting chat we had. And going from that also, I've had uh, invitations to a couple of other forums like that to, to discuss. And I've also had personal uh, contact with certain top uh, people in policy. For instance, there's uh, Dr. Usman Badiani of the International Food Policy Research Institute, I think, uh, as the director of Africa there. And we've had personal chats based on this visibility from what I had uh, in my participation in the Falling Walls Lab. Uh, we keep conversations going that way. So another extension of my network and my ability to translate my research to what uh, policymakers can understand and also uh, see how impactful it can be from their direction as well. And to be honest, I think it was also the, the wake up call. And, and we were kind of talking a little bit about it back in 2019 that, of course, the, the way you carry out your research is absolutely paramount. But without this um, interaction with how to put it in practice or the interaction with the policymakers, it's much more difficult to drive this change. Yes. So this is basically a, a partnership that also the MSCA, the Falling Walls Lab competition, pretty much stands for getting getting researchers such as yourself ready to present those ideas but also making you realize as well as your colleagues you need to bring this into policy because otherwise oh, yeah. It, yeah yeah the policymakers make the decisions eventually and so no matter how brilliant your research is uh, if it ends up for instance in, in publications who reads publications that much you know it's just for special for people in your area, you know, for instance, and, and other people who might just get special interest in that research, but they, they, they put it in, in the public space and getting the policymakers to to understand and to take it in is where we can influence how this becomes real in the real world and how it also gets to to be used, you know, especially you know researchers do lots of things at the cutting edge, you know, trying to advance science, advance our knowledge or understanding, just like the the, the, the talks we listen to today, the fifteen pitches, uh, you know, awesome talks like that. But if these end up in, in publications that are specialized for people in, 
you know, the same area or field who understand just that to debate about, then the impact is difficult to see for the real person out there on the street. And this is where exactly I agree with you, the MSCA, the Falling Walls Lab, and all who try to, uh, you know, pull researchers, no matter how reluctant they might be, out of their own little cycle to come out in public and begin to, you know, talk about their research this way. It's definitely commendable and, and an awesome one. I've experienced a great deal how this works, and I'm really happy that it's still going on that way. Spread the word, spread the word. We'll do, definitely, <laughs> surely. I'll, I'll, take a, I'll take a five seconds publicity break, if you don't mind, just to tell everybody that you have five more minutes to vote for your favorite pitch. So again, please register on the platform. You will have the possibility to, to click um, on the button that says vote for your favorite candidate. Please do so now so that we can register your votes and uh, cast the public award. So final call, final five minutes call for the votes. Mm -hmm. Emmanuel, coming back to you, can you give us some scope? You went to the final in Berlin. How is it? How, what is it that the, the, that the Falling Walls Lab final looks like? What's happening there? And how was the, the broader conference? It's like the ultimate TED Talks of, of, uh, of research, isn't it? I can tell you so. Yeah, and even more probably. The finals was, it was, it was a spectacle, I would say. I mean, I, I'm really glad I was able to attend in person. You know, uh, last year was difficult to have it in person, and I hope uh, the winners of this set would be able to have it also in person. Uh, it was, uh, well, there were different activities involved. We had the opportunity to visit a couple of sites in, in Germany. So it was held in Berlin, um, and we went to the Archaeological Museum. I also went to um, uh, the Machine Learning and Robotics Lab. It was great experience to see you know, the level of advancements in research that they have been carried out in these uh, places. And we also had the opportunity to have something called brain dates. So you could actually have a brain date with anyone, anyone at all. <laughs> Keep the topic out there. If it's interesting, someone agrees to have a date with you and you just pick each other's brains, talk about uh, things that you have mutual interest in. And I met a couple of people you know, just from that brain dates in terms of in groups and also one-on-one, -on -one, essentially, uh, the opportunity to talk to laureate, Nobel laureate winner level people, you know, at that point, uh, who attended the conference as well. And of course, the conference, which was uh, uh, an awesome one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can use that anyway. <laughs> it was an awesome conference to, to listen to those level of uh, talks that are essentially advancing and breaking boundaries of uh, research greatly. And yeah, I presented my, my talk as well. And even there, I also had the opportunity to meet the Dr. Osman Badiani I was talking about, who was part of the jury, uh, called me aside personally and, and gave me a very unique insight to my research. You know, I never thought of how I could apply my research in um, agriculture, for instance, even though I'm an agricultural engineer by background. But he gave me the nudge and told me there was possibilities in this area. And you know, it was another eureka moment for me. And uh, I also had great networking opportunities with several people from around the world. I mean, I met with 99 other uh, people who won from their different labs. So it was the, the event was fast paced over three days or so, but we had opportunities to sort of interact very closely. And to date, we also have this uh, social network platform where we keep in touch. Uh, with each other so the joy of being able to you know email or call up or just you know send a text to any of the participants is something that was also great it's the big extension of uh, the network that i had it was also interesting being in berlin at that time because uh, the, the historical side of it was not lost on me as well so all around it was a, a great a fascinating fantastic and spectacular experience for me and it's also the the time around which they they made it. I I I think the symbolism of of the entire final it can never be lost on any of us. So it's the ultimate ultimate proof of collaboration and and human power to drive change. Exactly. Yeah. Well, great great speakers on the day of the conference, for instance, and you know being there right there in the room with them and listening to those talks and seeing that number of people who believe in science and who believe in what we're doing in terms of research. As you said, it's like the 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 hallmark of scientific you know um, discussions among people who are doing it all over the world. It was a great experience. Good one. Emmanuel, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing a bit of your experience. I think it's 
It's it's it's fair for me to say you'd absolutely encourage everybody to become an MSCA fellow if they're not so already and definitely try and take part in, in this competition, right? Oh yes, I'm a preacher of the MSCA right now. So I tell everyone, you know, get into it, apply for the projects, uh, get involved in whichever way you can. It's highly rewarding. It's uh, for me personally, I, I think I'll continue to reap of the benefits, you know, all my life because it's set me on a very good foundation and has given my profile a great boost. My visibility is awesome. Participation in the Fallen Wars Lab and winning and all of that improved my confidence in myself, my confidence in my research, you know, and the issues of um, validity of what you're doing and how relevant it is. And your fund has been happy with it, you know, all gives me. Uh, great joy and happiness and the kind of people the network i've been able to meet and get to know and relate with is also another very great part of it so i encourage everyone to come in and enjoy this experience that i've had <laughs> yeah thank you so much um this is definitely the best call to action and uh we'll uh we'll, let's let, let's hope more and more researchers end up taking taking this challenge on to to learn share and definitely find and challenge themselves to find new ways of, of applying uh, their favorite topics. Exactly. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Best Thank of you, luck. Brother. Thank you. Run well, so you're still in, in, uh, in Europe. And, uh, and best of luck for, for, for when you will heading over across the Atlantic. Thank you very much, Helga. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you to all of you who have casted your vote. Um, we have now closed the, the, the voting session. And I now would like to bring a little challenge for you. If we could please uh, see the video of the new game, I would like to launch for you for the next five minutes. So what we would uh, like to, to get to challenge you on uh, for the next five minutes is that we want to play on, on this topic of collaboration, right? And collective intelligence. Um, in less than, than 10 minutes, actually for the next five minutes, we would love to hear what you think that this code stands for. It is a very, very special code. Uh, that we would love to see whether you guys want to take a challenge into breaking in the next five minutes. We have a couple of hints for you. The first one is that this is an element used in the research. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, this is pretty much is, is the first clue. This is uh, the name of the researcher uh, that has used this element actually in, um, in the work that they have done um, is a palindrome. So the name of the researcher is a palindrome. As a second clue, she or he is a researcher that holds a PhD from Coimbra. Third clue, her or his project is about cleaning water from toxic elements using this element. Clue number four, he or she have been a MSCA Falling Walls Lab contestant in 2020. So the question is, could you break this code? What is the secret element used in the research and what is the research about? I'll now let you try and break this in the next five minutes when we will resume, come back and hear who the winners of the Falling World Lab Maris Kodowska Curie Actions Competition is. Thank you and good luck.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I believe you have had uh, a lot of time to decode uh, this little code. Um, and I'm just curious, how many of you have actually identified it? The answer to our game uh, is actually electricity. As, as you can also see here, the code is written using the pigment cipher. Um, and this is pretty much geometric uh, substitution cipher, a uh, simple substitution cipher, which exchanges letters for symbols, which are fragments of a grid. And uh, I hope you had a lot of fun trying to break this one. Uh, I didn't ask, Emmanuel dropped off the, um, the our conversation. I didn't ask whether he broke it or Aurélie or Xiaomeng, but uh, we'll see afterwards. Yeah, yeah, more and more challenges. Maybe more time is needed. <laughs> all right, I hope you all enjoyed uh, our game a little bit, but I have the absolute uh, pleasure to invite you to the official award ceremony of our competition today. Uh, and I will have, I will invite here with me, Denise uh, Christofidou, uh, who will have the pleasure after having had the tough task uh, to go through all of the pitches uh, that were presented. So are, is everybody ready for the finalists announcement? Welcome back with us, Demis. How are you feeling? How difficult is it to be the chair of the jury? It's very difficult when you have so many brilliant uh, contestants and, and you have to make choices. It's very tough to make choices because you leave behind people that were also worth of, uh, of an award, but that's how life is. So we, we have to deal with it. Absolutely, absolutely. And thank you so much for actually being the champion. You always say September is, is the best month because it's science and researchers month. And that's, we, we can definitely, we have felt your passion for many years now. And, and thank you for being an ambassador for breakthrough research also going forward. So with no further ado, Imis, I believe you can announce who won the awards uh, from the jury. You've also become an ambassador and a member of this family, Raluca, and uh, I thank you very much for that. Dear participants, dear audience, I would like to congratulate all the contestants for your passionate and inspirational presentations, for your innovative research ideas and projects, and for your ability to present your ideas in such an accessible way. You made our life difficult, but we will forgive you. Thank you. It was a pleasure, a great pleasure to listen to you and learn from your pitches. You deserve full recognition for your great achievements, which aim to improve the world we live in. I know that you have put a lot of effort into preparing for this competition. You also put us, the jury, to hard work. We had passionate discussions about the pitches, and it was very difficult to choose the best of the best. So let me also thank my colleagues from the jury for their time and their views. And now it's time to reveal the winners of the fifth edition of the Falling Walls Lab MSCA. The last time we checked, we had 650 participants online and around 300 of you managed to vote. Thank you very much for that. As announced before, this year, exceptionally, the top two winners will be invited to join the finale in Berlin. Without further ado, I start from the prize from the audience. The audience award goes to Milica Militz. Congratulations, Milica. Oh, oh. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all of the people who voted for me and for all of their support. Uh, my family, friends, colleagues, supervisors, unknown people who like the pitch, of course. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much. We also thank you, Milisa, for your authenticity. <laughs> this, is, this is what went through and reached the audience. Now I will announce the third prize. So in third position, the jury decided that we have 
Milita Milis. Uh, congratulations. It's me again. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you again uh, for this. Uh, I mean, thank you to the jury that recognized the impact of my pitch. Oh, yes, it's you again. This, uh, this is an impressive honor. You must feel very proud of you, and, and so should your family and, and uh, all the people that have sponsored you until now. Definitely. It's been a great experience. Maybe if you hear some noises, it's uh, <laughs> applause from the other room. We do, it's fantastic. It's heartwarming. And now we go to our two winners that we go to Berlin. And we have in the in our second place Anwesh Bhattacharya. I hope I pronounced it well. Anwesh, congratulations. Well done, congratulations. And who else? Anwesh, you're there. Yes, I Anwesh, I think you're on mute. Hello. Yes, yes. Um, thank you very much uh, for uh, for uh, appreciating my pitch and for selecting me to be in the finals. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the Marie Curie uh, Fellowship and also everyone who has been associated with my research, my supervisors, uh, my colleagues, uh, my friends and family. And um, I'm very excited uh, to be going to Berlin to, to take part uh, in, in the finals and, and to discuss uh, about emerging uh, scientific walls to fall. So, so it's a great opportunity and thank you very much. We are also uh, excited and proud of you. Bravo. Thank you. And, and now who else goes to Berlin? Julia Rocco. Congratulations, Julia. Thank you. <laughs> I was not expecting this. I would like to thank you for organizing this event. It was really wonderful to interact with a lot of talented researcher in a period in which interactions are very limited. Then I would like to thank uh, my supervisors for accompanying me every day with my work, my colleagues, the other fellows of my program, Mr. Career, and all my friends and family for supporting me every day. Because research is uh, it's not difficult, but it's for sure what makes uh, the world better. <laughs> it's exactly that. You, you've said it. Congratulations. Very big congratulations to all the winners. You were exceptional. And to everybody who participated, thank you once more. I urge you to continue your valuable work, share your breakthrough ideas, explain to citizens what your research is about. That's very important and reach out to policymakers and companies to make your ideas flourish. Thank you all. Stay healthy and see you next year. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you so Thank much. You Thank you so much to, to everyone. It, it has honestly been, been a privilege. Uh, and thank you, Themis, for welcoming me into the, the beautiful family. Uh, congratulations to Julia Anwesh and, and, and Milica and to actually all of the contestants. Uh, this is the official closing of the, um, of the fifth edition of the Falling Walls Lab Muddy Curie uh, Actions Competition. Uh, I absolutely look forward to hearing how is it that all of these pieces of research have progressed in this year. Honestly, from Julia Anwesh, I do expected to come back with some gossip from Berlin. Let us know how, how it went. We need to have another interview um, with you, uh, Aurelie and Xiaomeng also afterwards to hear more just as, as Emmanuel shared. Um, but thank you, thank you to all of you. And I was, I was thinking very much throughout the day that indeed for good days and true innovation, you need a couple of ingredients. Uh, one, you need human interaction, you need conflict, you need arguments, you need debates. And this is what this, I would say, all competition environment is all about, you know, prepping the brilliant researchers, you to do exactly just that. Find partners, drive awareness around your pieces of research, ask the tough questions and come out uh, with, with the best solutions, change policy and drive change for our better good. So 
you're you're making us all so so proud and so hopeful for the future so thank you all so much uh and i know we don't get the chance to take a selfie back in 2019 emmanuel do you remember we managed to do a selfie let me see we're in the pictures also let's just try everybody's now on screen and do a, a a good selfie and i would say we can we can use my superheroes words from dexter's laboratory every day is actually a fine day for science so here's to science yes and to raluca the best moderator ever okay. it's it's easy it's absolutely easy to be inspired by by all of you so thank you so much oh, the one.